Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Sean. Hi. So, uh, it's about big data. Are you, are you, if you're not here for big data, probably in the wrong room unless you're just here for the pizza, which is uh, okay too. I, I thought, I, you know, in preparing this, I thought I'd talk a little bit about, uh, well, well, I had a, it's, it's a reflective uh, point, and you, you start to think a little bit about the data journey that uh, I've been on most of my career. Uh, it's been a long career. I started life as a statistician, so I'm used to small data and small data sets and mathematical analysis. And then, you know, when I started, there wasn't a computer science degree, so I coded uh, my own data management systems. And then hierarchical databases came, and uh, relational databases came, and I learned about them. And then the machines changed. They became shared memory machines, and shared nothing. And now we're into the world of NoSQL. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Michelle said, uh, this, this came together fast, so I'd like to get a sense of who you are, so I don't give a talk that's totally inappropriate for my audience. Maybe I can have a show of hands who's currently working in data in a commercial field of any type. Okay, thanks. Developers, you can obviously raise your hand more than once. Okay, product managers or managers. All right, students. Okay, uh, DevOps. Oh, we got one. <laughs> cool. So, uh, people in traditional database or data management of any type. Okay. Visualization or data mining. Okay. And is anyone working with a NoSQL system already? What? Introduction or just uh, playing with? All right, all right, that gives me an idea. Thank you. I'll tailor things to what I heard. So I came across this. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a cute parody of conversations that I'm sure are happening in boardrooms all over. There's a lot of bugs about uh, big data. A friend of mine calls it, let me see if I get this right, MBLIF. M, I'm sure I'm getting the initials wrong. It stands for Management by Latest In Flight Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm familiar with that concept. Uh, there's some real value in the data, and it's also, it's trendy. It's a buzzword. So maybe tonight I can shed a little bit of light on what they might be able to do with it. So talking about what this talk is, uh, big data is a big field. It's a survey of big data from many different perspectives to give it flavor. It's not going to dwell in on. It's not going to dwell in on any one big data product. It's just a broad, broad uh, level set. Um, I will drill in on architecture and uh, technical trade-offs and things you ought to think about as you, you enter big data. I'm an architect, so I think from an architectural perspective. But I think everyone has to think from an architectural perspective as they use it. That's my own bias. And then in the end, I have some references and information. You can find out where I saw all my material from, and you can drill in further if anything interested you. Or if not, you know, there's pizza there. Did I mention it? Yeah. So let's, 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 let's go. So what is big data? And one perspective is the business side. And it can be said that big data is enabling new products or new insights. That's it. That's what it's about. Everything else is just commentary. But some of the commentary is pretty interesting. On the new product side, sensors are everywhere. We're not talking just the manufacturing world. We're talking children's stores. The sensors enable new product development as we actually see how the products are used in the field. But they also um, enable new services, such as proactive maintenance, by finding out something breaks, they can offer a product that they didn't even know they were going to offer when they, when they issued the product. Now casting, that's an interesting term. It's the ability to estimate metrics, 
such as consumer confidence immediately. Find out what people are thinking at the moment. Ever narrow segmentation of customers, we're all familiar with that. We're getting targeted by both products and advertisers, right? From the analytics, talking not just about the data, not just about the information, but how to get to a decision. So that means real-time correlation enabled by the removal of sample. And said big data is N equals all, meaning you get all the data. I'll have a lot more to say about that, but to some extent it's true. It's about previously hidden data that might have been too costly that you now can get at and generate new insights from that. So an example of that might be not just shoppers' transactions, but your peer group's viewpoint of what you ought to buy. That's a lot more data, and it's a lot more related. Social. Facebook is going to be on a lot of the pages that I talk about, right? There's other social networks, but that's the biggie. Facebook has a, a personalized user experience and its own advertising model. Geographic data. Who has a smartphone? Stupid question, right? Okay, so smart routing, real-time traffic. And it's about finding ever smaller needles and ever larger haystacks. Uh, I don't know if I asked who's in the scientific community here, anybody? Okay, so uh, the CERN Super Collider and uh, physicists looking for new particles and finding new particles in large uh, energy collisions, right? And since we're talking about business value, what's it worth? In 2010, this was a, what is it, $100 billion industry. And it's been growing by 10% a year, which has doubled the software industry as a whole, which might explain why some of you are in the room here, right? All right, diving in a little bit from a technical perspective, what is big data? It's been said, Doug Laney of the Garner Group uh, has the definition that I think has become an industry standard. It's data that exceeds the processing capacity of conventional systems in volume, velocity, or variety. Volume is not just the sheer size of data, but it's how fast it's growing. Velocity, of course, is how fast it moves through the system. And variety might be either the ability to define structure, or if you can define structure, how fast that structure changes. Diving in on some of these 3Ds and some examples, you know, when I started working with megabytes, that was big data. Not so much anymore. Um, we're talking petabytes for most organizations, exabytes for a few, and there's a rumor that out in the desert in Utah, they can store you uh, Yoda bytes. So, so, so these, these don't mean much to me. There's an unreadable chart at the top. Um, but a, an exabyte is about a thousand petabytes, and it's about a million terabytes, which, and I know devices are bigger than that. And then there's zettabytes. That help us. So some examples of big volume we're all familiar with Google, right? They, they, they just, they just, uh, Catalog the uh, internet. Uh, I mentioned the NSA. Uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, stored a trillion objects in 2012. That's a platform for building other things. I'll talk a little more about that. I don't know how many bytes each object had, but that probably represents a bit. Scientific pursuits again. You've got physicists, you've got astronomers, retailers, and astronomers. And uh, auction site. Just check and see if it's readable. All right. Second D, what's big velocity? Big velocity can be about peak events, such as a liquidity crisis in the financial market, Cyber Monday, or the launching of a new government program. It can be not waiting, as in the case of your location, watching a movie, a fraud investigation, or uploading your pictures, or it can be steady state velocity, that major retail store, or my firm, Copyware, which measures the performance of websites and underlying infrastructure and needs to stream all that data back 24 by 7. 
let me play an older um, uh, IBM uh, clip that illustrates the need for up to minute data to make decisions. Hopefully I can do this and still get back to my presentation. If you were to stand at a road and the cars are whipping by and all you can do is take a snapshot of the way the road looked five minutes ago, how would you know when to cross the road? Nine out of ten organizations still make decisions this way every day, using out-of-date information. The organizations that are most competitive are going to be the ones that can make sense of what they learn as fast as they learn it. That's what I'm working on. I'm an IBMer. Let's build a smarter planet. So, you know, if you're standing on a street corner and uh, uh, all you can see is a static picture of uh, traffic going by, how do you know when to cross? Traffic's not static. Same thing about insights in the world of business today. If you get a static picture of time, you don't know how to make a decision. That's all that really said. And then it advertised for IBM. Yeah, that was really good. The third, the big variety. What's big variety? It's about diversity and how to manage that diversity. Some examples might be a document backup problem all sorts of files on a computer. Might be pictures and video as Facebook deals with them. Sensors that I mentioned before, the GE, the NetApps deal with. Or it could just be about putting all your different files and variety in many different places, as a Dropbox or Sugar City. Just curious, how many people use one of those services? Dropbox, Sugar City. There, the messy aspects of dig, dig, uh, of dig data and big data is challenging. You might have a structure, but it can change frequently. There may be multiple sources of data you're integrating with. I talked to somebody uh, about how that could be an issue with big data earlier. Or it could just simply be contextual information. Is Portland, Oregon, or Maine? Is a dog an animal or a food? Visualization is becoming increasingly important in this field in order to picture uh, how your big data, uh, what the variety is and how it's moving. So those are the three B's of big data. And then other firms have come along and they've said, maybe there's a fourth or fifth. Oracle makes the claim, and I think they're right, that it's not just about volume, velocity, or variety, it's turning it into value. And they'll help you for a price. <laughs> IBM makes the claim, you know, what good is all this data if it's not correct? And there's an entire ecosystem to check to make sure it's correct. And they'll help you for a price. I mentioned visualization. This is kind of cool. This is a visualization of Wikipedia edit edits. It's turning textual information into a way of displaying to see how it changes, how frequent, how long the changes are. There's a URL on the bottom that I could dive into a little. And uh, my understanding is this presentation will be made available so you can all look at it at your leisure. But this is kind of fun. There you go. Let me get rid of it. Goodbye. All right, look at Peter visualization. So just to show a couple, you can go through at your leisure. But this is how edit history of all those articles dies off over time. This is that chromogram again. This is all the different people and all their uh, the major editors on Wikipedia and what they edit. I think everyone's, well, I don't know, are people familiar with a Wordle? The concept of what's trending by how many times the word is mentioned, right? It turns out Obama's trending. Where, you know, a map is the, the useful way of displaying where things are, uh, are. And then the degrees of connection, what's the top articles, or even how many people are contributing and how many ways to the articles. There's many more on this. It's, it's a fun site. I'd recommend it.
And the answer is, wow, that is slow. This is not like a high velocity screen. <laughs> All right, so I threw this slide in because I think it's important. In fact, I was just having a conversation with somebody earlier about this. What big data is not? Why don't we just call everything big data? Why, why is there this qualifier on it, aside from the definition? Because big data involves trade-offs. There's something you give up in order to be in a big data system. So if you've got a traditional payroll system or a human resource system, a database management system that's been around 30 years can handle that need. You don't have to go to big data. You've got a machine on the shop floor and you're sampling from it. And you want to make sure it just stays within a certain spec so it doesn't overheat or get too cold. Sampling's fine, right? That's not big data. But if you are in the big data world, you've got to deal with these trade-offs. And the trade-offs uh, are many. It's bleeding edge technology. It's been around only four or five years. Some of the uh, uh, things you're accustomed, if you're working in software, in the software industry, to believing are there or not. Uh, database management systems have been around 30, 40 years. There's subtle definitions of consistency. Not what you might want to say. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more about that later. There's complexity involved in big data systems. And it's new and hard to find skills. You pay a people who know what they're doing in big data a lot, which might be another reason you're all sitting in this room, right? So it's just a caveat to make sure the business case warrants it and can tolerate the trade-offs before you call it big data. Because otherwise, grandma's going to be faced with this choice. And she doesn't need to be faced with that choice, right? All right, let me dive in a little. and. Um, if I'm losing people, please let me know, because um, this, is the under, uh, this is the architectural underpinnings of big data, it's sort of technical in nature. Um, anybody ever hear of the CAP theorem? One? Okay. All right. Let me explain it a little then. So the CAP theorem states that, um, that you need to keep track of your beer at all times. <laughs> All right, the capture states that any network shared data system, so the data systems available over a network, can have at most two out of three of these very desirable properties. What are these properties? Consistency, availability, and network uh, partition tolerance. I'm sorry. Consistency, there's different shades of consistency. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you all get a picture of what consistency means, right? High availability, when you go to use the system, it's, it's around. Partition tolerance needs a little explanation. Partition tolerance means that some part of the system might not be working, but you can still do some useful work. So one way of thinking about the CAP theorem, and I promise this is relevant, why you need to think about the CAP theorem, is if you have a multi-node system, um, maybe two nodes on the opposite side of a net part network partition, and you allow one node to update its state, the other node will become inconsistent, right? And then, and then you forfeit consistency. And if the choice is to preserve consistency, one side of the partition must act if, as if it's unavailable. And then you forfeit availability. It's only when the two nodes are talking to each other that you can have availability and consistency and then you forfeit network partition. So that's why the CAP theorem states, in a sort of a gross generalization, that you can only get two out of three. The point is, for modern distributed big data systems, you can't afford to forfeit network partition. Something's always going to be out of whack, right? You got to be up in some way. And so you got to choose between consistency and availability. And you know, you can't really afford to not be up in some way, so you can't forfeit availability. So that's, that suggests that you gotta do something about consistency. Um, this slide shows a traditional database management system usually trades between, uh, has consistency and availability, although there are some exceptions to that. NoSQL, the technology to manage big data, 
lives in the high availability and, and partitions how it's for. So that gets us into what is consistency in the big data world. It's a, it's a concept called eventual consistency. Anybody hear that term? All right then, I'll dive in. So it's a weaker consistency model. It's not what you might be used to. It um, means that there's an unbounded delay in propagating changes from network one network partition to the other. This might lead to stale data. So you're in Australia and you've updated the data and you've got a network in New York. New York may not see it for a while. It also, you, your first thought might be, well, why don't I just wait until it gets updated? But the unbounded part is important. You can't wait. There's a network protocol that al allows waiting in the traditional world, but then you lose your network partition, your partition tolerance. Another concept about eventual consistency is that you trade, um, you don't have any ordering guarantees at all. So, oh, I don't know, for example, suppose uh, I need to do three things in order to be consistent. You know, maybe in a traditional database world, I'm, uh, I need to debit your account when you go to an ATM, and I need to uh, give you your money. Those two things would be independent in the NoSQL world. There's no guarantees if those things are separate that they'll be together. So you take those two things together, and from the system perspective, and this is the key thing if you're, in the, uh, if you're a system engineer or an architect or a business manager, um, you're always in an inconsistent state. And any logical consistency, you've got to design into the system yourself. Your technology doesn't do it for you. Make sense? Losing people? Wish you were drinking more beer and eating more pizza instead. Let me know. All right. Um, you probably get a, an example of what that means. So the HA example, that would mean that when someone made a request, then there would have to be an event trigger to sort of ensure that the database is going to sync out on the but by the year rather than building the database structure. So later on, that's right. And later I have an example of a trade-off between a traditional system oh, okay. and a, yeah. a, a, that's exactly right. What you get with this trade-off though are some other nice properties. You're dealing with a lot of data and sometimes you can't afford if a piece of machinery goes down or something to just fail. So some of these NoSQL systems by having multiple places where the data is at can restart themselves. Self-healing is the concept. You can also allow scale. So all of a sudden, the volume is such, I'm getting so many customers that I need more, I need more power. I can just add another node. That also helps with disaster resilience. So if my system goes down, I can have a node somewhere else. You know, think of uh, Hurricane Sandy or something like that. If that wipes out a whole area, I can keep a node in Ireland. Another property of NoSQL systems that a lot of them have, Cassandra and Hadoop are, are, are one of them, is a property called schemaless. Uh, for those in the database world, you're familiar with a table, there's columns, there's rows. These columns are applied to every row. Schemaless means you can pick and choose which columns are applied to which rows. Attributes, if you will. The other, the, one of the drawbacks is they're called NoSQL systems for a reason. They're not standard. You got to think about how am I going to retrieve my data? It's not SQL, right? All right. So some of the trades as a when you're thinking about uh, you're thinking about these systems from the business perspective, you might not want to get involved in these uh, uh, these newfangled big data systems in your production system. You might have a research to production pipeline, so your research system could be handling all your big data, you glean your insights, and you push it over to your production system that handles it in a straightforward way. If you can make uh, a trade-off like that, and I've seen that done uh, by a company that's right down the street, um, I've seen it done a lot, um, you've made your problem a lot easier. Similarly, your third-party data may not be um, 
if you if all the people that you're talking to don't have to interface with the big data itself, you can simplify your your problem a lot. It's been said that uh, the big data, those SQL systems, are much more flexible than traditional systems. Well, they're flexible in that schemaless way, but they're not flexible in the consistency way. And you got to think about that logical consistency no matter what you're doing, because again, it's up to you or your product or your company in order to make sure there's consistency on top of the technology. This is an interesting idea, radical transparency. So suppose you, want, you, you have a product and you want to make available um, You have a, a healthy, sustainable food product, and you want to actually show your customers the farm plot the food comes from, and you want to show the nutrients that that food was fed before they order it, and maybe the entire ecosystem of wh whatever happened to that food that's going to be on their plate. The big data world can support that, and I call that a kind of consumer audibility rather than a government requirements audibility. And that gives you an edge, perhaps, over somebody that just has on their website sustainable food, right? I mean, it's reassuring to, to actually see. My tomato was fed right there, you know, on July 3rd. Only water. Uh, infrastructure. These days, starts assuming SaaS, software as a service, and in the cloud, unless there's a very compelling reason to build your own data center. Amazon Web Services has a whole set of services that um, building blocks, components that you can use to build your system, storage, have different prices, they have durability guarantees, elasticity, if you need more, they can add to it, availability, how often these components are up. You as the designer, you as the business manager, need to decide how to assemble these components in a way that makes sense to your system. Part of that decision is thinking about your data. Can I, how do I split up my data so it makes sense to be in different places? Because if I, if, I, if I need my data, if I need to combine all my data and it's all over the, all over the world, I'm gonna have a problem. What are, the, what are the ways I'm gonna use that data so I can split it up? Similarly, the protocols by which your uh, components talk, a concept called stateless, which means that you can just add a server. It doesn't have to uh, go back to the same server every time somebody talks to you. There's some data architecture decisions along the way. And this gets into the big data world. I've divided data stores and data in transit separately. Data stores, there's some categories that make sense to make sense of the technologies out there. Do you have a document storage problem? You know, such as backup or a key value problem, many, many attributes you're trying to store. Uh, that could be machine sensor information, high graph information, social network, or maybe you're a game player and you have to keep a lot of state connected. That, that might be an in-memory system that you're trying to design. Data in transit, if you can divide up your high write activity from your high read activity, perhaps with two different components doing that, <coughs> there's an architectural trade-off you can make. You have to look at your security vulner vulnerabilities, denial of service attacks versus uh, do I need it encrypted? Do, where, where are my single points of failure? Do I have a distributed problem or a centralized problem? Maybe at the origin, maybe at the endpoint, or maybe somewhere in the middle. And I mentioned those visualization tools that's, that are useful to picture the data. It's also useful to think about how you're going to, your reports or how you're going to just test your system. I'm not going to go through this slide. Don't worry, people. Uh, it's there for you to dive into. I've put together some of the more common solutions following those categories in different uh, areas. Um, the pros, high-level pros and cons are there. And I'd uh, be happy to talk about if anybody's using one of those stacks later. The ecosystem that's related to those data stores. So by far and away, the most popular active ecosystem is Hadoop. Um, 
in parentheses are, are four pay vendors that will help you with support or tools. Uh, a pack, this, that's all open source, the Hadoop project. Uh, Data Stacks is a vendor that will help you with a Cassandra stack, which is another very popular stack. And the last bullet is mostly, it's not open source, it's mostly very specialty data stores that help with a very special problem you might have. The data modeling example that was brought up. So let's talk Twitter. And I don't want to talk about the high amount of tweets that they process. I want to talk about the interrelationship between data. You have publishers and you subscribers or followers of those publishers. In a traditional database, low volume world, that would be one table. If I chose to follow you, that transaction would get committed, there'd be a tag that I'm the follower, you're the publisher, I'd immediately be able to see all your content, you'd immediately know that I'm following. In the NoSQL world, there's too much data, the trade-off for cap, the carrot theorem and all that, so you'd have separate indices, separate ways of sorting who's following who, and being known that you're following. What would happen is, I choose to follow you, immediately that would be updated, I could see your content. At some later point, it would update the fact that I am following you and you would know it. At some later point from that, those transactions, not in any special order, at the point before, would go out to other nodes. So if you're in Australia and I'm in New York, it might take quite a while for you to know that I'm following you. This is okay from a logical model, because think the Twitter problem. When I go to follow you, I want to see your content immediately, right? But you don't have to know immediately problem. You can wait, i.e. eventual consistency. I'd like to take this um, example one step further. Suppose you're uh, an application programmer and your boss is from the traditional database world and she says to you, you know, I don't, I, I don't like this idea of keeping it all separate. How do we know that the people following the publishers are total up, those totals, are the same as the publishers and all the subscribers. I'd like you to put together something that shows me that those total. It turns out in a NoSQL world, that's not very easy to do. Because remember, at no point in time will you have a consistent state for all of them. So I guess the point there is, um, you're making that trade-off, and you need to think through your application data, wiring to make sure your users have a positive experience, and you always have to keep in mind the eventual consistency aspects of the data. Anybody working with a distributed system has to keep that in mind. So Did that help at all? So right. how do you solve that problem if you need to know that answer? So you don't solve it in the total that way. You ask a different, different question. You check to make sure that um, eventually you can see. You may not be able to get a sum total of everything. You have to ask a different question. So it's just plain, there are unanswerable questions. In the it's a plain unanswerable. You can solve it in the QA world by, uh, by quiescing your system and seeing that if it all ever totals. Not a very useful thing to do for an operational system, though, right? It's a different way of thinking than if you're a traditional database person. I put together some gotchas. I had 50, but then I figured the pizza and the beer would run out and not good. So what are some of the things you need to watch out for and put them together in these systems? And you've heard some of them already, right? From a business factor perspective, though, I thought I'd mention privacy. Uh, it's, it's got special meaning to me. You could say, well, this is not unique to big data systems. It's true about any system. But the idea that you can get ever narrower segmentations of people, so you, you can, you know, in a, in a small place like uh, Nebraska, where people are separated, the fact that I've aggregated to all the 50-year-old uh, men in high tech probably identifies me uniquely, right? Um, so you need to, I think everyone has an ethical responsibility working on a product like this to keep privacy in mind. I think business and uh, product managers need to uh, not surprise people. 
by the insights that they find. Abuse. Um, I mentioned high velocity. The, the example is uh, front running, high frequency traders. Anybody read Michael Lewis's book about uh, flash, flash boys? Yeah. Scary, scary stuff. The fact that uh, there are people that have built dedicated pipelines that can get can look at the trades you're making before they actually hit the stock exchange and can get fulfilled and buy it and sell it to you at a higher price. It's not illegal, evidently. It seems like it's immoral. Immature technologies and companies. The, te the uh, technology you could be dealing with might not have all the features you're used to. You're not going to do backup in this kind of system. There's just too much data involved. So how do you deal with that? Companies. Some of them are startups. If you bet your business to one of these companies, make sure the ecosystem is live and vibrant because you may be supporting their product if they go out of business, if you bet your, your, your product on it. Business and product changes affect the architecture. So that eventually consistent model, right? Uh, or along comes a new, new, uh, new product that needs to merge with it. And maybe that eventual consistency model that was perfectly adequate for Twitter is no longer adequate. Think Google Plus the search company, that the uh, the social media company versus Google, the search company. They had a very different problem. They probably had to add different components to the technology stack. And I guarantee there were a few engineers that had many sleepless nights over that. And it doesn't have to be that dramatic. If you're a manager of uh, technical people and you're bringing in new technical people, how do you explain this logical consistency model and what they need to look out for as they're programming other parts of the system and your system is vast? Technology and infrastructure. Talked a little bit about the data in transit and at rest is a nice way of dividing things up. I can talk a long time about all the different methods of moving data. Some of the NoSQL systems have their built-in ways. Most of the time you're dealing with it yourself. Um, it's not a bolt-on. You've got to think about it as part of parcel of the product you're designing. Security, same thing. There are different issues with data in transit versus at rest. I have a special place in hell for the people that blur high availability with disaster resilience. Vendors do it all the time. They say, here's a sliding scale. If you want more high availability, you can put the scale over here. If you want disaster resilience, performance is usually sacrificed. There's uh, sometimes good reasons to do that. It could be um, that you're controlling costs, but you need to know what you're doing, and you need to alert senior management if you decide to do that. Analytics is fun. This is a whole area. This is a business and analytics uh, idea. So um, it's been said that you can replace the sampling and aggregation with all of the data. But that's not really true. You're getting all of the data through a very biased filter in the big data world. So a municipality decided they were going to have a new, have a new app to uh, uh, pothole app. Not to create potholes, but to uh, take pictures of potholes. And the app puts the location on and sends it into the Department of Public Works. And faster. Um, pothole fixing and identification of where the potholes are. So far, so good. No problem. PR department got a hold of it and said we can now fix all of our potholes faster. Newspapers and TV got a hold of that and said, well, wait a minute. No, you can fix all the potholes of mostly urban, young, professional, affluent people with smartphones. The neighborhoods that don't have that aren't getting fixed faster. Correlation is not causation. Any statistician can tell you that. Anybody here of Google Flu Trends? Okay. So this was a great app, new app. Five years ago, it, uh, without a single medical checkup, it could figure out where influenza breaks were going to happen across the United States just by what people were searching on. Didn't know how. It, you know, you could speculate, well, if I'm searching on flu remedies, then I'm probably thinking I have the flu, right? So. But you didn't really know what caused it. Uh, come 
so about a year ago. Oh, and this uh, this application could had as much accuracy and it was much faster than the CDC. And so people predicted the end of the CDC because you could just use Google Flu Trends. You fast forward to a year year ago, and Google Flu Trends overstated a flu epidemic, a flu outbreak by fifty percent. The problem was Google couldn't possibly know when something changed that mattered to the underlying cause. They just had correlation. The cautionary tale there is you got to somehow, and this isn't easy, build in a trip one. You've got to figure out when something's changed. Data snooping or confirmation bias. This is another uh, thing that statisticians can talk about. If you measure all the possible correlations of all your independent variables, you don't get more knowledge. You get more noise. Eventually, uh, you get correlations that are meaningless. I have a, another um, URL here, sort of a fun URL for people that are bored to death of the technology. Um, it's called Spurious Correlations. The divorce rate in Maine, how it tracks very nicely. To, Let's start this. So, violent suicides are dependent on our, how much we spend on technology. It turns out there's a very good regression on that. I hope Nicolas Cage doesn't make more movies because I sure as hell don't want to drown in a swimming pool. This is relevant to everybody who's had pizza here tonight. Be careful when you go home, right? <laughs> All right. And there's many more. Uh, the point is, over any given time period or any given data set, if you measure enough thing, you find stuff like this. It doesn't make it true. Irrelevance. Remember that um, cartoon at the beginning about uh, what are we going to do with this big data? I would suggest before launching a big data project, you have an idea of what you might want to do with the big data. Maybe a very small idea. Start small and look at that. Otherwise, you could just lose focus as an organization. IBM has a point. How do you check the results? How do you test the whole system? How do you reproduce the results? So I'd like to leave you uh, with this quote. Uh, I, I do believe big data is in its infancy. The process of making is iterative. Back to Google flu trends, when people predicted the, they overreached a lot when they predicted the end of the CDC. But they overreached just as much when they said Google flu trends was a failure. It turns out that Google flu trends, together with the CDC, could give you an early warning system that's now verifiable, the tripwire. So you can see if you were leading into a problem. I mentioned references. When you get this, uh, here's some URLs. Um, it, I'm, I'm making this available with a copyleft license. If you know what that is, it means you, you can, uh, the URL for that is there. It means you can use it any way you can see fit. Uh, you don't owe me anything, but you can't make a profit on it. You need to make it available for free as well. Or talk to me. Maybe we both can make some money. <laughs> So with that, that's what I got. Questions? I'd love to hear use cases you have. I, I always like to hear new use cases. Um, technology adoption, uh, or we can talk over beers later. Uh, that'd be fun. And, and oh, and if uh, you hated this, uh, please tell me. If you like this, please tell me. Write to me. You don't have. To. If you hate it, you don't have to tell me now. <laughs> Questions? Question. Yeah. I found, I think I haven't understood schemaless. I, well, I thought it was tables and indices and normalization, but I really don't think I know what schemaless means. Okay. So, in a big, in a NoSQL world, you don't really have tables. Right. right. So I'm just using that as a way to explain it. So if you have a bunch of different rows in a traditional table. 
your columns are fixed in, in a database. Well, you've defined in advance the schema, if you will, what columns are available. Then it's just data that goes in it. Now, there may be nulls in it, but those columns are, are together with every row. In the NoSQL world, I can add a column to this to that, that row. It doesn't have to be in any other row. Once the data associated with the row, with the row is fixed in the schema database, but it's not fixed in the schema list. Right, and, and typically in the NoSQL world, it's not even a row, right? You might have a very, very broad, you might even have yeah, a column on the table. It could be a hierarchy like JSON and this sort of thing. Right, and so you're not updating, which is how you know, you're just replacing with a whole new row. Yes. To follow up on that, I understand how that works with a key value pair store because the key is right with the value. I mean, it tells you what it is. Are there other other architectures or mechanisms that tell you what data is in this row? I mean, what what are the right? So, as you mentioned, just the broader with a key value store, you're you're storing both the name of the column. Sometimes the name of the column is the data itself. You're, so you're showing the name and the value. With, with, with each um, piece of data point. The um, Hadoop system is just an underlying bunch of files. And so what they allow you to do is um, create a, uh, a meta schema on top to uh, sort of a pointer to say what could be available and then there's a range. It's not totally schemaless, but it's more flexible. Um, document store systems like CouchDB and Mondo, well, that data is completely unstructured, so you don't need to see it. It's just a block. So those are standards. But, but those are individually indexed or identified? They're individually indexed or identified. There's no scheme at all with schema lists. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I'm sorry, just ignore me here. Yes. Sure. Can you say what's unique about Hadoop aside from the fact that you can make a very large score sure. from it? Who's heard of Hadoop? So Hadoop uh, has a distributed file system, which uh, usually means in practice that you're distributing the data to at least three places, any piece of data. Uh, typically, two of those places are are located close together and they're immediately updated at once because you have a much greater durability guarantee. If only one place is updated and you lose it, you're done, right? A third one could be somewhere else. So that builds in your disaster recovery because those two, if that site is unavailable, you can go to the other. On top of that, there's a map reduced uh, framework. So when you're programming it, um, it's a way of parallel programming. So it processes on um, many different CPU nodes at the same time. So that allows you to rapidly go through a very large data set very quickly. Those two things taken together um, are the basis of the distributed file system in uh, so MapReduce is the key, it's the essential way you program on the on Hadoop. Right, and then there are projects that live on top of Hadoop that... On top eat, of MapReduce. On, on top of MapReduce, and sometimes not even on top of uh, MapReduce. Sometimes there's a, well, to, to stay with that for a minute, there's a, there's a, most of the projects are on top of MapReduce. Uh, Hive is a database-like system that you would use SQL-like commands on. Uh, but, but, but it has a high latency because, because you know, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but there are now other systems that just quickly go, go underneath the new system and go and get the data. So they can solve a, I need this data very quick and I don't want to spend a lot of time going through that entire framework. They suffer from the same problems database systems do. They go in after one node. If that query dies, they, they're dead. But it's a way of using, double using your Hadoop system. Yes? As if, you know, other, other parallel files have been around for a while, like GPFS and MP, 
how does kind of SQL stack compare to those, both from a complexity standpoint and from why is it so much better nowadays? Greatly reduced complexity. They've made parallel programming was hard. I, I did parallel programming. It started as functional parallel programming, and then they moved, uh, Thinking Machines was the first company that did data parallelism, which is what these are. Um, and you need to think in a very different way than traditional programmers do. Um, and MapReduce is a paradigm that allows you, you don't have to worry about uh, where your deadlock systems are. You don't have to worry about uh, the intricacies of parallel programming. At the cost of, some things are not going to be as fast as traditional, I know my application and I can do this better. So like anything else, when you move into um, a generic way of doing something, it uh, handles 80 to 90 percent of the cases easier and 10 percent of the cases not as efficiently. Broad brush statement. In terms of kind of the different stacks of, kind of those SQLs, there's a lot of them, you know, the attachment of Vertica. In what ways, in what scenarios would you use one versus the other? Sure. Or are they kind of virtually interchangeable? No. No, they're not. Um, so that's that big, there it is. So you don't know what you're doing, you got a lot of big data, you got to keep it forever. You start with Hadoop, period. You've got uh, a key value store, a bunch of metrics, time series in nature, high volume rights, Cassandra's. I'm, I'm grossly generalizing and all the vendors out there that will ever see this, please don't hurt me. <laughs> but these are the more popular ones. A high, a high right uh, system would be Cassandra um, or, or React. React has been around a long time. Um, in memory system, there, uh, there's an example. So, so um, depending on your application, I, I don't know if you know what an OLAP system is versus an OLTP system. So OLAP, you've got a whole bunch of unstructured queries and you need, uh, you need to do diverse things versus a high transaction system. Well, then you might want to think of a Vertica where you can easily column store your data. So to, you know, it, it, it starts in what category you're in and then there's subtleties from there. But no, once you start within one technology, it's not swappable. No, and you're oh, choosing exactly. the technology, I guess. When you choose what technology to utilize, yeah. it's also, I guess, the technology. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, people experiment, right? Um, I don't know what to say about that. Yes? I have a question that's more on the application side. Okay. So, can you give an example of how big data can be used to promote more purchases. I have a lot of retail clients and I'm thinking, so you know, we use past history as a big indicator, but that's a small picture. So like are you talking about now pulling from their Pinterest boards and they've pinned like 12 different pairs of jeans and we like start feeding that into the model? Can you just talk sure, about that kind sure. of stuff? Sure, sure. No, good question. Not that the others won't. <laughs> so um, so there's multiple ways of answering that. Uh, referrals are being really big, right? I mean, it's hard to imagine a big a vendor, a big retail vendor today that doesn't solicit a, an ecosystem of consumers who say, what do you think about that? And what do you think about that product? And the minute you start doing that, you're gonna have key reviewers, and you might even wanna segment your reviewers into somebody who's a seasoned, who knows your products better, So you know, in my mind, I would believe them more, or who is a user of that, you know, maybe you do hiking equipment, and if you could segment your reviewers into people who um, do a lot of hiking versus novices, their reviews might count more. Uh, Hostel World does that. So the reviewers there are, self, are, are classified somehow as to people who've used them for the first time, or seasoned travelers. When I go to a new hostel and I see a seasoned traveler that says, you know, the room wasn't clean, I'm more apt to believe him, right? 
Uh, how you, you mentioned a good uh, point, how you integrate with other products become, might become a big data perspective. So uh, if I buy hiking equipment again, and well, I might, uh, I might also have a need for hotels and plane fare and cars, and that gets me into the TripAdvisor world and Expedia. Um, peer influence. So in terms of, I guess, tying it all together to yes. figure out what you specifically want, so you're saying in this big data world, like, some company might have, like, Easter Mountain Sports might have your email address because you bought the hiking shoes, but airline and so-and-so has where you like to hike. And then how do you kind of Ah, the secret you sauce. Are. You're asking about the secret sauce. All right. You are you in different places. IP address is one. Okay. You know, uh, most of us, even though they can change, have a static IP address most of the time. Some of us, um, depending on the site, they ask for information up front. So before you go to a dating site, they ask for your real name. Some people give it. You know, um, so that ties it together. Um, Third party arrangements between companies. You go to Facebook and you click on a new app. Usually you get something back. Sorry for avoiding this side. Um, you, you get something back that says this kind of information is going to be shared with them. If you look carefully at that kind of information, it's how it's tied together. Other questions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hope it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.